I've already spoken about how music uses various pre-existing systems in our brains, which have developed for a number of different reasons during our long and arduous evolutionary journey as a species. Maybe the simplest example of this idea of this overlap between the elements of music and the functioning of our brains can be given with volume or dynamics in musical terminology. We have evolved to perceive volume, differentiate between volumes and understand different volumes relationships to one another by means of surveying and surviving our surroundings. Volume or dynamics is an important consideration in music and is an especially important part of many genres of music which might use changes in volumes for musical effect more than other genres do. One only needs to look at a score of classical music, for example, to notice all the instructions regarding volume, piano or P, meaning soft, for example, or forte or F, meaning loud. And then you have subito forte, SF, for suddenly loud, or MF, for medium loud, and it goes on. In fact, a piano is actually called a pianoforte. We say piano for short, but it's really pianoforte because you could control volume on this instrument much better than its predecessors due to its weighted keys. This revolutionized musical composition for keyboard instruments. Volume was now a factor for keyboard music as it had already been for a violin or an orchestra, for example. Volume, like other elements of music, is something we come to music pre-programmed to interpret. What music does with volume, whether it uses a quiet sound to be gentle or sly or shy, or a loud sound to be tragic or celebratory, depends on the musical context. But even that general range of feelings is mostly predetermined. We wouldn't usually be celebratory quietly or sly loudly, no? So music simply hacks into all these pre-existing associations and takes advantage of them. This might happen at the level of the composer, who marks the dynamics on their score, or the interpreter, the instrument player, who can also take such decisions to bring things out of the music that even the composer hadn't imagined. Luckily, we don't need to learn what volume means in music, but rather we only need notice how music takes advantage of all the pre-existing associations we already have with volume. Apart from volume, we also use, or can use, pitch in music. Pitch is what gives us the different notes we call A, B, C, D, E, F, G. As is the case with volume, we already possess the mental hardware to interpret pitch in the same way that music uses it. For example, the difference between really as a genuine question and really as a rhetorical one is communicated in tone, in pitch. The same mental systems which interpret that are responsible for interpreting tone in music. The same also goes for beat and rhythm, our already expert understanding of which allows us to walk or chew without injury. We can even dialogue with our bodies, such as when we notice an increase in our own heart rate or a change in the rhythm of our breath and try to consciously calm ourselves down. This interaction between mind and body occurs through beat and rhythm. So we already possess musical systems in our brains and in our bodies and we can make the knowledge these systems harbour conscious knowledge so that we can use it musically. Beginning by diving right into the world of pitch, pertaining to what we call notes, scales, chords, keys and harmony. This is traditionally the most complicated area of music and the one generally saved till last in musical education. But it's only complicated when you learn it as if you didn't know it already. Even though we may as of yet not even know what words like chord and key mean, we already possess a wealth of subconscious knowledge about them, which we'll now begin to make conscious. So when we play a note, for example, if we bow this string on the violin, causing the horsehair on the bow to rub over the metal string, lubricated by pine resin dust, making the string vibrate. This vibration is amplified by the instrument body, in this case the wooden hourglass-shaped violin body, which is something like an ancient speaker, and that causes the air around the violin to vibrate. Wood, horsehair, tree resin, silver and steel all conspire to create this sound. But not just that. Also nitrogen, oxygen, argon. 
the molecules that make the air we breathe. These are what bring this sound from the violin to your ears. These are the messengers and without them we'd have no sound at all, like on the moon. These molecules surrounding the violin vibrate when we play a note and that vibration travels through these molecules, through the air, but as it does so, it encounters resistance as the air molecules bounce against one another as the sound attempts to travel through them. And thus sound comes in waves. We hear sound on Earth precisely because we have air or an atmosphere to create waves in. So how big a wave travelling through the air is determines its volume. The bigger the wave, the louder the sound. And how many waves are created determines pitch. So what determines whether something sounds grave or squeaky or anywhere in between is simply how fast it makes the air vibrate, which we measure in waves or vibrations per second, also known as hertz. So the first and thickest violin string, for example, causes the air to vibrate 196 times a second. That's not a particularly low note because the violin has a high range, but that's the lowest note on the violin. This note causes 196 vibrations per second in the air and is a G. If I then press down on the string, making it a little shorter, I get an A. So here's a G vibrating 196 times a second and then an A vibrating 220 times a second. Now I say this is A, G and A because we have other notes we also call G and A. This, for example, is also an A. This one vibrates 440 times a second, whereas our first one vibrated 220 times a second. This here is also an A. This one causes 880 vibrations a second. Do you notice anything about these numbers? Any special relationship between 220, 440 and 880? They're multiples. They're multiples. One is double the last, no? So, in fact, whenever we get half or double of 220, for example, or half or double of that resulting number and so on, we'll get another A. Whenever we get half or double of 196 or the resulting number, we'll get a G. So this G vibrates at 196 hertz. And the next G, at double that, vibrates at how many hertz? 392. 392, good. If you're not used to doing mental arithmetic, it's not essential for this course, but well worth developing as a general and musical skill. The simplest way of doubling 196 is to double 200 and take away two fours, or eight. No, 400 minus eight, 392. The relationship between each of these Gs we've just seen, or indeed between each of the A's that we've met so far, is called an octave. The oct in octave means eight as in octopus, which has eight legs, or octagon, which has eight sides, even October, which was once upon a time the eighth month of the year. This is because counting eight from any note will give us the same note again. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then back to A. After G, we go back to A. We don't have any H notes. That gives us eight. If we begin on C, the same will happen. So count from C and including C, eight notes. And of course, when we get to G, we go back to A. You can use your fingers. So C, D, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and the A to C again. So that's why the distance between these two notes is called an octave. It's called an eight, an eighter. So that gives us the same note, an octave higher, or in other words, double the pitch we started from. So if this C is 65 hertz, how many hertz is the next C, an octave higher? 130. 130. You didn't need to hear it to know that. So this is one of the most fundamental relationships in tonal music the world over, the octave.
or in other words, the concept of doubling or halving. This note here, which I'll also play on the piano because it's too low for the violin, causes the air to vibrate 110 times a second. Do you know what note this is? What note am I playing with 110 hertz? Let's see. This A here made the air vibrate 220 times a second. Wow. So it's an A. So it's another A. Yeah. Brilliant. So this note, this A, is just another number. 110 hertz, 110 vibrations per second. And our brains knew that already before we just learned it, because in response to hearing this pitch, our brains fire synapses in empathy with the note, precisely 110 times per second. So our brain doesn't simply hear the note, it actually plays it too. This might go away to explaining the transcendental effect music can have on our consciousness. We don't just hear music, we momentarily become it. So we've seen how doubling a frequency gives us the same note, and this same musical decision of understanding a pitch and its double as the same note has been taken numerous times by human cultures all over the globe over thousands of years, long before anyone presumably knew anything about vibrations per second. And that's because when we play two notes an octave apart at once, we can hear that they are essentially the same because they're almost indistinguishable from one another. They sound like one note. That was two A's an octave apart I played there. If in contrast, we play two different notes, so like an A and a B, we really notice the difference, how two A's share the air flawlessly and A and a B together seem to compete for the air somehow. If you listen closely, you can hear the dissonance at the end there. That kind of wah 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 sound. Can you hear that? You might need headphones. That sound is the sound of numbers crashing into one another. We're playing 110 hertz and 123 and a half hertz and those numbers don't get on nearly as well as 110 and 220. So we call both of these notes A, or both of these notes G, due to their ability to blend into one another, an ability they have because of the symmetrical mathematical relationship they share. One is half or double the other. If I play one A and then add the next A, an octave higher, the sound changes minimally. It's like we play this A, and then when the higher one chimes in, it's like, well, yeah, that's what I was saying, really. <laughs> if I play just the first A, and then play it together with the A an octave up, it's very hard to notice the difference between playing one note and the two notes if I hit them at exactly the same time. Can you tell the difference? Not really, no. But you can. Yeah. But it's very slight, yeah. right? So what was two notes? The first one. Exactly, exactly. But it's a very minuscule difference, no? So two notes, an octave apart, share the most simple mathematical relationship we might have between any two different numbers. And it is this relationship of doubling or halving, a relationship so simple it works both ways, it's doubling or halving, that we hear in the air when these notes blend into one another. So he said 65 hertz gives us this C. How many hertz is the C an octave higher? 130. 130, which sounds like this. If you play them at once, they'll sound as one. So if you know the hertz value of one C, you know them all. If you know that one C is 65, then you know the hertz value of all the C's. If you know the hertz value of one A, you know them all. Just keep doubling or halving. So it's as if, according to music, 65 and 130, or 110 and 220, were the same number. And if you think about it, mathematically speaking, they kind of are. Whatever you can or can't do with 110, 
you can or can't do with 220 or 440 or 880. If 110 is divisible by 5 or 11, so it will be 220, 440, 880 and so on. If 110 is not divisible by 6 or 7, neither will 440 or 880 be. These numbers have the same mathematical qualities and thus, it's as if they were essentially the same number, or in the case of music, the same note at least. As mentioned, the very simple and very strong mathematical relationship of doubling or halving we call the octave, and it is essential in tonal music the world over, or rather an essential concept in our understanding of tonal music. So as mentioned, we are looking at Western music specifically, but the fundamentals of any tonal system are more or less the same because they're all based on the same physical world, whatever else is going on culturally. As seen, this double half reversible relationship of the octave is audible in the air, and so the octave will be essential in all tonal music the world over. Only it might not be called an octave. In Western music, octave you might hear in any number of musical contexts. It might be used to refer to the space between one note and another as we have been using it. In that case, people might call it an octave or a perfect octave. They mean the same. Or you might hear a musician say, play the octave, to mean play the same thing an octave higher. Or octave might be used to talk about an instrument's range, for example. A piano has a range of seven and a bit octaves. From its lowest note, vibrating 27.5, times a second and its highest at 4186 hertz. What note is 25.7 hertz? You can just double that number until it becomes familiar. 55, which was a... Uh, Keep doubling. 110. And again? Keep Two, doubling until you're short. 20. <laughs> what note was that? That was a... Uh, yeah, it's an A. An A. So octave is a very important term to understand the fundamental meaning of, which is just doubling or halving. This will help us understand all of the applications of the idea of the octave in music, and more importantly, the pivotal role the octave has in the relationships between other frequencies of the tonal system.